Do you guys work with JSOC? Yes or no? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. I yield the rest of my time, Chairman. So what is the significance of that incursions in uh, national security airspace, including over nuclear weapons facilities, nuclear labs? It's very alarming because, you know, this facility is extremely sensitive. Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever going to get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weapon Weapons. My name is George Knapp. I'm joined by my friend and colleague and young Jedi apprentice, Jeremy Corbell. Jeremy, what have you been up to? Man, uh, probably the same as you. Just total relaxation, nothing stressful, not doing anything with my life. <laughs> yeah, ditto here. I've been doing a lot of lollygagging, uh, you know, just kind of laying around, not doing anything. Actually, I've been traveling. I'm so far out of the loop. I would need the James Webb space telescope to even identify which galaxy the loop is in. I mean, so I'm going to have to depend on you to bring me up to date. I mean, uh, we have, do cross, cross paths now and then, such as last week. Yeah, man. So that's um, so, you know, obviously we're joking. We're working our butts off and not everything we do is always always public. You know, a lot of the work we do is building cases and kind of over time getting to witnesses and getting them to come forward. Um, also, we have some projects that are, you know, in, in works right now. So we've been real busy, but we did have a chance to hang out together. Um, I, I feel like you kind of extorted me to go because I didn't want to leave my home, but you're like, let's go to contact in the desert. And that it's a, UFO, people that don't know, it's a UFO conference, a big one, you know, right by my house in the desert. So it, it was really neat to kind of go there together. And we got to uh, ride in the space tank, which is the, uh, <laughs> with the cyber truck. This has the UFO on the front. So it was really fun, man. And, and we got to see a bunch of friends. Uh, who are some of the friends we saw? Let me just say this. I was picked up in what I thought was an alien spaceship. It's the Cybertruck uh, with the uh, a certain distinctive license plate on it. That Cybertruck made news. Did you, did you notice that in UFO world and the L.A. Times? There were pictures of it. And, and uh, people are speculating which big fat defense contract you've got that made you able to afford that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's just that's just hard work, buddy. But it was great. Yeah, I've been waiting for that truck for a while. It's pretty great. It has not broken down on me. I was really worried driving an all electric vehicle, but it's like a spaceship. I mean, it really is like new technology to me. I've always driven driven uh, you know gas cars, but it was just it's really neat. It's a weird thing to be in that vehicle. But I told our buddy Rogan, you know, that I that I got one of those, and he's like, nothing better for a UFO investigator. So I felt pretty good in that yeah. vehicle, man. It was good. It's spectacular. Good gosh. It's like a rocket ship, man. You, you yeah. punch it and your head goes back like that. Anyway, I really enjoyed sitting it in and I'm uh, and riding it and I'm now very envious of the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> contact in the desert. Uh, I've been invited to that event a lot of times. Always wanted to check it out. This time, George Dory, my colleague and friend uh, on Coast to Coast AM, asked me to come and do a, an onstage presentation with him. And I couldn't uh, couldn't resist that invitation. We went. It's a big event. A lot of speakers. A lot of really good speakers. I had a heck of a lot of fun on stage with George. He's funny as hell. I mean, when he when he cuts loose, he's funny as hell in person. That's awesome. Yeah. We, you know, I got to kind of dip in a little bit. I was working on a project during that weekend, as you know, George. And uh, we had some great conversations. So we got to see our buddy uh, Ernest Klein, Ernie Klein, who who wrote Ready Player One and a bunch of other things, and. It was just really cool to, to hear always. He, I learned something from him, even though we disagree about many things in the UFO world. It's always cool to kind of hear his perspective. He's very thoughtful. We got to hang yeah. out with uh, Dave Foley and Tom for their for their podcast. Really? That's the name of their podcast. We got to see them. Ernie and, Klein is such a smart guy. Um, he knows so much about UFOs and related uh, su subjects, technology. You know, Ready Player One was a New York Times bestseller, huge hit. Steven Spielberg directed the movie, also a huge hit. Ernie then wrote uh, Ready Player Two. In between, he wrote another bestseller, New York Times bestseller called Armada, which is about an alien invasion. 
uh, fictional, but based on a lot of information that Ernie has gathered over the years. You and I took a trip to Area 51 uh, two years ago with Ernie, escorted him out there to one of our favorite places in the world. He's such a smart guy, and um, even though he wasn't a speaker at this thing, we talked to him so much, and, and uh, I know that there are going to be some upcoming I uh, interviews with him because he's just launched this major project called the Readyverse, which is a virtual reality universe, high-tech, spectacular. Uh, maybe we can put up a, a link so that people can find it. We actually have a weaponized episode with Ernie that people should should see because it was filmed in his home, which yeah. is just like the Pee Wee Hermit of UFOs. The, the house was amazing. Something profound appears to be happening to our planet. Something related to an alien presence. The original best evidence changed my life. The only media institution in the world covering the subject and the most interesting subject in the universe. People should check it out. And then we also did, we hung out with our friends from last podcast on the left. And that was a really kind of fun discussion. Uh, Henry reached out and said, hey, come on this. And they were there. They covered the whole thing. So I know people are real fans of last podcast on the left. And I know Henry and them, they're going to be dropping an episode soon that we participated in. That was pretty fun. They are very funny guys and smart. Uh, I know the first time I listened to their show, it was a, a deep dive into Skinwalker Ranch. And, you know, they saw beyond the usual debunking and arguments to try to make fun of the whole investigation of the ranch. They're really good. They, they do their homework. And it was a fun exchange. People will see at the end, there's some games that are played, uh, one word answers that are pretty darn funny. And as soon as I got off that podcast, I'm thinking this, damn it, this is what I should have said. Only <laughs> yeah, of course. There are things to say later, you know. Yeah, better answers later, man. And then we also got to see our buddy Dan, who everybody should go to his social media. I'm a, I am a true fan of what he does. He, he takes complex ideas, puts them onto all sorts of social media, and does these little kind of reels that describe stuff. So his handle is hey Luke L U K over there. And I, I think it's um, his, his thing's called Fifth Pillar, but it's our buddy Dan. And it was cool to actually see him and be able to spend a little bit of time with him because uh, last time we saw him was at the hearings, the UFO hearings in D.C. And it was just so quick. So it was neat to be able to see him. But there's some people I didn't get to hang out with that I wish I had been able. Like Matt Ford was there and we had talked a bunch, but I've never been able to like actually hang with him. But we were so running and gunning. We didn't get that time, but it was really neat to all get together contact in the desert probably the only one we're going to do this year when we go to those things because we're busy working but it was fun well there are there's a lot of news to cover a lot of things yeah. have happened since the last time we recorded one of these podcasts uh, yeah. can i say is this officially season two now or what it's got to be man because i keep pulling you getting you in it's season two this is season two officially but we're just going to release as we see fit that's the way it's going to go every once in a while depending on what happens in the world yeah right. So, so, go ahead. UFO news. I mean, f what's a big one for you? A lot of discussion, a lot of activity in Washington where members of Congress are asking some pretty tough questions. And it, it goes right to the core of one of the issues, the principal issue that we're going to discuss in this, in this program, incursions in uh, national security airspace, including over nuclear weapons facilities, nuclear labs, uh, there were some very tough questions that were asked of the Secretary of Energy. Fill us in on that. Yeah, so that was really um, interesting. So you've got an oversight committee where Congress is asking the, the Secretary uh, Jennifer Granholm of the uh, Department of Energy, the DOE, which has notoriously been connected to the UFO or UAP issue because a lot of the structure for secrecy and compartmentalization came from the atomic program. So there you have the, the current head of the Department of Energy, and we have, you know, our pit bull for UAP transparency, Representative Tim Burchett, he starts it off, and he starts it off about incursions at nuclear sites, which is a big topic in the UFO field. Now, the whole thing of oversight wasn't about UFOs, but he started it, and he kind of relayed it to um, Representative Luna, who just, oh my gosh, she threw down these questions and, and it got kind of uncomfortable at, at, at one point, which was to her credit, she did not let it go. So that was really neat. Anybody can go kind of watch that. I know I posted it on social, but you hear their questions about UAP. They are not putting it down and they're cornering uh, Secretary Jennifer Granholm. And one of the things that came out of it 
is that uh, the DOE, the Department of Energy, does work with JSOC. What's the acronym, George, again, for JSOC? Joint Special Ops Command. Right. So, I mean, like a badass military group that basically, you know, goes in and takes care of stuff. You know, do you work with them, the Department of Energy? And she was really evasive on the question of of saying yes or no. She's like, well, we work with uh, everybody in defense. And Representative Luna was like, it's a yes or no question. (laughs) And eventually she goes, yes. Does the DOE currently work with JSOC in order to handle security measures? We uh, work with all of the security entities around the federal government. We're part of uh, a, a, an overall all of government effort on both cyber as well as uh, national security. Do you guys work with JSOC? Yes or no? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. I yield the rest of my time, Chairman. So, what is the significance of that? That the Department of Energy works with JSOC. We, we've heard some of this from Christopher Sharp and his reporting. What is the significance in your mind about that? Well, there is a lot of speculation and some actual evidence that JSOC, Joint Special Ops Command, is involved in crash retrieval operations, that they would be the guys that would be sent out, something unusual, crashes in the desert. They're in charge of going out, securing the perimeter, scooping that stuff up and taking it God knows where. Those allegations have been investigated by Chris and a lot of other folks. So that was one line of questioning that... um, that Representative Luna pursued. Now, I don't know who's doing the prep of her, but she obviously had done a lot of homework, had some great questions worked out, and she was a pit bull. Now, I think uh, over the past year or two, she's kind of deferred to Tim Burchett, let him be the point man in asking these tough questions, also Matt Gates. This time, she took a back seat to nobody. She really uh, zoomed in and, and drilled down on the Secretary of Energy, uh, and I almost felt sorry for Secretary Granholm at, at some point. My personal impression, and I know people will probably be ticked off at this, my personal impression would be that Granholm is not in the loop, that they would keep her out of the fray. She might know some general uh, uh, facts about what's going on in the Department of Energy, but I'll bet she has not been briefed or had not been up to this point about the possible involvement of DOE in reverse engineering non-human technology. I think it probably is uh, somewhere hidden in DOE, at least part of it. Um, And I bet that she asked for a briefing after this hearing, but I didn't get the sense that she really knew. She certainly knew about JSOC and its involvement with the uh, DOE, but I can see a lot of non-UFO related duties that they might perform in securing the perimeters and airspace of uh, nuclear facilities where there have been a lot of intrusions, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, she knew enough to be evasive, and the bottom line is people can, can claim ignorance, but you're, you're the head of a department or defense department. It's like you should know because the American public and beyond wants to know what's going on. They're asking for transparency. So it's kind of behooves her to to get caught up on that. Oh, the yeah. dismissiveness might have been ignorance. But on the other end, we know that the UFO topic, that it is um, the most guarded topic. I mean, right above our nuclear submarines, the positions of those, it's like the UFO topic is super guarded. So it was just, it was a great thing to see our representatives representing us and pushing that really hard. Now, there was a great article. I got to give a shout out to Cree, uh, Chris Eberhardt, how you pronounce his last name, I believe, from Fox. Man, he, he consistently does these articles on Fox News And he did an article about the DOE hearing and everybody should go check that out. But it was it was great to see everybody pushing forward. But there was so much news in in the past few weeks about UFOs. I mean, you're just seeing people throw down like there was a a tweet by Representative uh, Garcia about UFOs. Now, he's he's tweeted before. But let me just like read you what he said. I he's from California, right, George? Yeah, he's a Democrat. Yeah. Yeah. But he's from California. That's great. So he says, I've been interested in UAPs long before I got to Congress. It's important we approach UAP legislation responsibly. We should take this work seriously and center our exploration on science and data, regardless of those who dismiss this work. I am committed to public transparency. So you're seeing this kind of wave of people saying, "Okay, look, I'm committed to this. I'm not putting it down. And it was just neat to see some of these people throwing down about this in Congress and and Senate, you know? Yeah, I'm glad to see that it is really bipartisan, that there are people in both parties that really are out in front on this. And Garcia is one of them. And and it's important because 
you know, you got pit bulls like uh, Tim Burchett and and uh, and Representative Luna in the House that are very conservative Republicans. It's too easy for people who want this issue to go away to dismiss this as uh, that's just these crazy right wing Republicans who are pursuing it. It isn't in the House. They've been the, the loudest voices, but there are other members of the House on, on both sides of the aisle who are equally interested. And in the Senate side, it is truly bipartisan. I mean, the Schumer Amendment is being resurrected. That's what we're hearing. And uh, you got Senator Schumer, who obviously is the Democratic majority leader in the Senate, and then people like uh, Marco Rubio and, and others on the Republican side who are deeply interested in this. I, we're hopeful, right, that this legislation that was killed last year might have a chance this year? Yeah, I think it's like we're finding it. Like people were worried with that legislation about UFOs where they distinguish exactly what non-human intelligence is. They distinguish exactly what UAP is. It was a great body of legislation, but some people got hung up on the eminent domain part, which is where the government, if there's any bodies or anything like that or any craft, the government could just swoop it up. I understand that. I know people that we um, regularly kind of work with on this topic were hesitant because of the eminent domain. So they do need to tweak the language to make it palatable to pass through. And yeah, we definitely hear that's happening. Uh, We can get more into specific on that later, but you know, talking about being bipartisan and, you know, this moving into a presidential kind of category of the UAP issue. Did you see um, Trump talk about president Trump talk about uh, the, the UAP issue on the Logan Paul show? Did you see that? Yeah, I saw a little bit of it. Yeah. Um, Consider me underwhelmed, but maybe I I don't want to get myself in trouble. But why don't you be the point man on talking about that? Well, just that um, this is politics aside. This is just that you have, you know, somebody presidential position who's openly talking about it. That's where we need to go. It doesn't matter to me if it's Democrat, Republican. We need to be having the conversation. So I like the fact that he was warmed up to talking about it. That's the way everybody should be open, non-dismissive and talking about it. That was my only observation. I just thought it was cool that you've got that yeah. going on. You've, you've had so many presidents talk about it from Obama to Bush to I mean, th- it's time that we have that open discussion. And that was just a cool way to see it on social media. That's it. I'm glad that Trump uh, answered the question in a way. But, you know, to me, his response was underwhelming. The level yeah. of interest he seems to have in the uh, issue is underwhelming. We know that he has, in fact, been briefed. But, you know, we've read about national security briefings and the morning reports that he would receive every day from his aides. And he didn't show much interest in any of that stuff. He didn't read the reports. Uh, it seems like he recalls being briefed, but his uh, the depth of his knowledge is like that deep. Uh, pilots came forward, he supposedly says, and and briefed him about what they had seen. And when asked, uh, does he believe them? Uh, there might be life out there, but really, no. Uh, you know, I I don't think that is it's a, an issue that really has captured his attention. I, I would not be um, uh, too optimistic about a second Trump term and how he would treat this issue. Um, it just doesn't seem to grab his attention very much at all. Yeah, well, what we do see is that other nations are starting to embrace the need and the necessity of looking, you know, soberly at the UAP or UFO uh, issue. So one thing that caught my eye recently is that in the European Union, their parliament, there's this effort for more transparency. And there's a gentleman um, who came to me one time, Francisco Guerrero. He's a, a member of parliament in the EU, and he put together an event which is like about aviation safety uh, regarding UAP. And it was, I think, uh, was very recently. And basically they were looking at aviation concerns related to UAP. So it's that, that one way to get in and start talking about this. But I thought it was cool that the EU did this and, you know, they had the goals of kind of opening up the debate, reducing stigma, um, ensuring, you know, that there is scientific, uh, and, you know, kind of look at this in transparency. So, it was kind of neat. Oh, they, they also want to change space law, um, you know, to be harmonized with the UAP reporting system. So, there, you know, you see the interest in government expanding out as we're recognizing the issue, especially when we're having things like incursions. We also saw, George, in the news that there's a new uh, Japanese UAP study, kind of similar to what we're doing, what, what's kind of happening here in the U.S. with Aero. So they're starting to look at it as a nation. Did you hear about this or read the articles in CBS and stuff like that? 
Yeah, I heard about it. And, uh, you know, it struck a chord because we've talked about why uh, Japan might be interested. There's been a lot of activity uh, over Japan, uh, including over U.S. military assets that are in that region. Right. We, we did a, a weaponized episode. We did. I, I don't know if people will, will remember, but I'll, I'll just go through a few key points. So, yes, these UFO swarms like we reported on from 2019 off of the West Coast. Well, they, they're happening everywhere. Like, that's the thing I tried to say to people. Just because we report on something because we have footage doesn't mean that there aren't other major cases. And one was just off the coast of Japan. I'll go through a few of the facts again so people remember. But it was late summer 2021. And this is something you and me, George, we were able to find out about this and actually pass it up a kind of chain of command because it was being very dismissed. So we took proactive efforts to get this on the radar of agencies that should know about this. It was the USS Milius, M-I-L-I-U-S. And this was in the late summer 2021. There was a swarm event and it was, um, by the way, this is a guided missile destroyer, the USS Milius. And there's everybody that I talk with who, who deals with in the Navy, this happens all the time, especially guided missile destroyers, apparently, where they're having these swarms and these observations of unknowns, unidentified UAP UFOs. So this is just kind of close to, I guess, off of Tokyo, Japan. There were about five UAP that were observed and they were actively, um, you know, kind of moving around over four to five nights from about 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. each night. And this should sound familiar because this is a, a, an event series where they're happening on a, events at, you know, different nights in, in succession, just like in 2019. So the characteristics that people would be interested in, you know, abrupt changes in flight and direction, which is one of the key things when you're looking at UFOs, UAP, no apparent origin or mothership where these things could launch or land. Yes, this sounds just like 2019. No sound was detected. And specifically, these UAP were impervious to Drake or anti-drone technology. So, you know, as this is going on, they actually got off-ship confirmation, which is very unique. So you get systems, platforms, reconnaissance platforms off-ship to say, yep, we're seeing them too. We don't know where they came from. We don't know where they're going. They're buzzing around, kind of not being hostile, but doing a performance. So the, the operational impact on that, I guess, when, when you're looking at people out at sea and, and this kind of thing happening right off the coast of Japan, is that there were no other ships for, you know, a few hundred miles. So it's totally isolated. Again, they don't know where they're coming from. Um, the encounters were becoming so routine over these four to five nights that they, the crew was literally told, stop, stop reporting it. Stop reporting it. It's inundating our ability to respond to other stuff, which is we know one of the big fears of the United States with the UFOs and UAP all the way back to the 1952 flyover was it crushed the teletype system, which made it difficult to communicate. So that's what they're worried about. Is it too many reports? It's going to stop the ability to, to properly respond. So there's a reporting issue. They stopped putting up the chain of command. Crew got, you know, kind of fatigued, you know, by having to wake up, get out there with the Viper team and record it. So there is footage of it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have it, but there is foot footage of it. So basically, that's the case that, that I wanted to kind of make sure people really uh, remembered off the coast of Japan. And I think it is good. The Japanese government is taking this seriously and starting to to analyze the UAP issue like the U.S., like China, like Russia. Yeah, it kind of sets the table for the meat of the program that we had in mind for today, which is these incursions in restricted airspace that keep happening again and again, in particular involving nuclear weapons, nuclear facilities. You know, uh, I think the the debunkers and even some UFO people want to explain away the Japan sightings, the, uh, the 2019 incidents, the same kind of incidents, 2014 and 15 off of Oceana on the East Coast. Those are just foreign drones. Don't worry about that. That's Chinese drones. We can't really prove that, but it's just, you know, standard old drones. Well, these same incursions have been happening since the late 1940s, since we were first building nuclear weapons and had nuclear labs. Those things were popping up, different shapes and sizes, but they've been studied by our government for a long time. No one has ever figured out whose they are or where they're from. Uh, they certainly weren't Chinese drones in the 19, late 40s and early 50s, or Russian drones, uh, these orbs, these large round things that have no wings or rotors or exhaust, no known 
method of uh, propulsion. They're not balloons. They can move around and, and evade uh, whatever we send at them. Those things are not standard drones, and yet they keep happening over these sensitive facilities. They keep going into restricted airspace. They fly over our most advanced uh, uh, platforms, Navy ships, the Air Force facilities, Navy facilities. Everyone's been getting these things, and there doesn't seem to be a damn thing we can do about it. Now, when you see these things uh, over decades, over nuclear weapons facilities, it is serious matter. It's something we need to consider. That was one of the things that that the Secretary Granholm was was asked about. Those members of Congress know this is important. It can't just be swept under the rug, right? Yeah, and that's kind of so the, the UAP incursions into sensitive nuclear facilities, turning them off and turning them on at times in multiple countries. Well documented. This is a core issue of the UFO phenomenon. It's a very small part of it, but it is absolutely a core issue. So that kind of brings us to what I want to talk about today. We're going to bring somebody on. You sent me an article from a sub stack and I hadn't you know, read a lot of this stuff, but there was a, a gentleman named Dustin Slaughter. Cool name. We're going to have him join us in a moment because he wrote a, a great article about an incursion at Pantex. So Pantex, if people don't know, it's a nuclear armament and disarmament facility in Texas, it's one of our most secure locations, like, like Area 51, right? It's super secure because of what they deal with there. Over the years, you and I have had a number of sources from within Pantex. Now, listen, about you know one out of every 10 people in Amaria, Texas, uh, work for Pantex. It's the biggest employer in the area. So you can't throw a, a stone without finding somebody that, that, that works there. But people have come forward and given great detail to us kind of off record and on record about some of these UFO incursions. So Dustin writes an article and it's about a UAP incursion into Pantex. And he wrote me a, a message saying, hey, I think you guys had reported on this before. So I looked through it all. Turns out it was a different incident. So I got a hold of him because you suggested we, we bring him on to talk about his article. But be, before we have him on, I just want to say that what we reported on in Pantex, we're going to remind people of that today of, of the, the case that we know about. But the reason why you and I had interest in the case we'll, we'll refresh people's memories on is because it was such a strange shape that was said to be going through the nuclear facility. It looked like a jellyfish. <laughs> so we have heard that before. What and in try? fact, yeah. And we released, you know, footage from Iraq. that was 2017, I believe, it was of a very strange looking UAP. Now, as you have told me before, and I have confirmed many ways, is that this this shape, you know, the, the jellyfish shape, man, it's back in pop culture all the way back in the day. This is something that has always been with us. It was a very common shape, but it was just so bizarre. But the reason we paid attention to the Pantex reporting, the sources we got there is because it's the same shape that went through that facility. So let's have maybe Dustin on. Talk about his sub stack, his article, which is super thoughtful. Get to meet the guy. And then we'll go back into what it was that happened that we first reported on at Pantex. Does that sound good? Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, introduce Dustin uh, Slaughter. Every day, our uh, inboxes get links to articles, photos, videos, speculation, a lot of material. And it's often hard to kind of keep up with it. A while back, early June, I get sent this link by a guy named Dustin Slaughter. I looked at the headline, and it says, UAP incursion at Pantex nuclear facility revealed in newly released document. And it's in a publication called the UAP Register, a digital publication. Uh, I looked at the headline, figured I'm going to come back to this when I have time. And I did. A, a week or so later, I come back to it and read this article. And wow, I was blown away. I mean, as Jeremy has explained, we have an interest in UFO incursions over Pantex because we've reported on it before. This piece uh, by Dustin Slaughter is terrific work, and it not only looks at specific incursions over that Pantex facility, but the whole larger history. Dustin Slaughter, welcome to Weaponized. I'm very impressed by the work you've done and, and can't, can't say thank you enough for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, guys. So could you give us a sense of when you jumped into the UAP topic, uh, what prompted it and how long you've been at it? Well, uh, that would go back to, uh, I believe, 1989 when I was about 10 years old. Um, 
my mother and I were driving back from my grandparents' house in Maryland, and we had just entered, uh, well, we were in central Pennsylvania going home. And um, we saw um, some lights in the sky that were exhibiting extraordinary maneuverability. Um, and that night, uh, you know, I will never forget. My mom still doesn't, hasn't forgotten. Um, we get, you know, my mom's in a panic. I'm like fascinated. <laughs> we get home and uh, she starts calling the news station. She starts calling the police. They're getting reports of whatever this thing is in the sky too, or these things in the sky. And, uh, you know, ever since that, ever since that point, um, I've been fascinated in the topic, but I think what really set me off was the New York times story in 2017. When did you start digging into Pantex and, uh, what was the, what prompted you to, to, to select that topic? Well, uh, it was actually kind of by accident because, uh, I had a, um, a FOIA request out to the department of energy for, UAP related records in general. It wasn't very specific. And, um, and that had been pending for almost two years. And, uh, lo and behold, just like, you know, I guess a few weeks ago, um, I get this, this tranche of documents back from the DOE finally. And, uh, one, and like the first document there was this report on this Pantex incursion. And I was kind of like, oh my God, I can't believe they gave this to me. So. <clears throat> So uh, give us the synopsis of what the details are that you were able to report and the UAP register. What incident, when did it happen, and um, how how redacted was the material that you received? It was heavily redacted material. Um, um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the incident took place on September 2nd, 2015. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, the, the, you know, the Pantex facility is the primary assembly and um, uh, and disassembly plant for America's nuclear weapons since like 1975. Uh, the plant assembled its final nuke, however, in 1991. And ever since then, they've basically just been doing disassembly of, of nuclear weapons. Um, and so essentially what this report outlines uh, in very scant detail, of course, is that this diamond shaped object that was sort of round on top, and that was what was described by, uh, by, uh, I guess, security, security personnel at the plant, uh, was, you know, was in the vicinity of the plant, was over the plant. I don't exactly know the details because it was redacted, but they ended up chasing this thing. Security chased this thing for several miles after it left the vicinity of the plant. And, uh, and then it just, it, and then they lost sight of it. So that's kind of all I got. <laughs> But um, there are some interesting redactions uh, and, you know, that I'm actually I'm actually have this matter in appeal right now to actually get the, the images, uh, you know, unredacted. Part of what you reported was that they not only tracked it for miles, the security guys, but there were photographs, uh, photographs, maybe video images were captured of this and you'd like to see them. Right. So would we. Yeah. Yeah. Because they never seem to be able to show us images. Huh? <laughs> um. That shape, uh, it's Jeremy, it's not exactly the same description that we had reported previously. Uh, Jeremy, maybe you can tell uh, Dustin what the time period was for our incident, the one that we reported on uh, earlier. Right. Yeah. So Dustin and I were able to talk about it because he had written me an email saying, hey, I think you might have reported on this incident. I read through the details. I'm like, oh, hell no, buddy. You got a new one. So that was kind of neat. So his um, event or the event that he got the FOIA information on from the Department of Energy was 2015. And, and with that, obviously, there's images. Um, and we're, I was going through his article and I realized it was probably picked up on the same sensor system the, the, the one that you and I know about, which is there's a thermal or FLIR footage from it that was picked up in 2013. So the end of 2013 or the first two months of 2014, but I think it was the end of 2013. There is footage of this jellyfish shaped UAP. Now, the one Dustin uncovered, they describe it, uh, Dustin, if you correct me if I'm wrong, but they describe it as a diamond, but it did have like a larger top. Uh, is that correct? A round is a rounded top. Yeah. A rounded top. Yeah. So in 2013, the incursion that we've reported on George, which again, there is footage from within Pantex uh, in thermal off two cameras 
of this jellyfish-shaped UAP going through. So I'll tell you a little bit about this one. That The facility has an aircraft detection system, but it wasn't set off in 2013. Um, uh, like a drone would set it off easy. I talked to a lot of the people that are um, in charge of security there, and a drone would set it off. There's anti-aircraft stuff and everything, but it wasn't. The, the, the detection system wasn't set off. Um, what caught it was this, uh, they call it a slew to cue long range motion detector camera. So it's basically like this primary, uh, defense system. It's called perimeter intrusion detection and assessment system, PIDAS. Um, so basically that, you know, they have to slew the camera or it automatically, automatically slews it when it sees a thermal image. So the, the, the jellyfish UAP, it ran directly next and parallel to the storage where the plutonium pits are. And what was interesting about that was it came in and it went out level controlled flight through these, uh, through the barriers of these pits. Now there's different types of, I guess you'd say security levels for these different areas. And we'll put up an image of, of exactly where the, the 2013 object went through. But this one was a materials access area. So that's MAA. It's an extreme level of security and kind of the highest of the security clearance required in those areas. It was zone four, between zone four and zone 12. So the UAP comes down, goes right through the corridor in a controlled flight. The people that worked there told me they believed it was some sort of reconnaissance thing. And the moment it left that edge of zone four, bam, it shoots up at a 45 degree angle until it can't be seen at an extreme rate of speed. So there are some similarities with what Dustin uncovered, except you know, the, the shape, the people that saw this uh, object at Pantex, it was domed on top, kind of like Dustin talked about. But this one in 2013 had tentacles or dendrites was the way they described them. It was about 10 foot in diameter at top, but longer. So this object came through almost like reconnaissance, UFO, UAP, kind of looking like a, a you know jellyfish, and then shoots off. So the similarities in Dustin's report is that they were trying to follow it. They were probably driving, trying to follow it. But the system that picked up the one Dustin reported on was probably that same system. That's what it sounds like, which is the um, you know the PIDA, which is PDES, which is Perimeter Intrusion Detection and Assessment. The SLU cameras. So just a trip, right, Dustin, to know that uh, you went digging and found a different incursion into this same military base just two years or a year and a half later. It's a trip. And it's also, uh, uh, I mean, to me anyway, it's very alarming because, you know, this facility is extremely sensitive. Um, you know, they have an enormous amount of plutonium uh, storage, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, on that, you know, in that uh, at that facility. Yeah. And, um, you know, the fact that you have these strange objects flying through with impunity and nobody can stop them, like that should be concerning to everyone. Dustin, is there an indication they tried to stop them? Uh, I'm asking in this context, you know, when you tell the person on the street, hey, our most secure nuclear facility had these incursions, they want to say, why didn't they shoot them down? I mean, you would think right. they'd have the legal authority to knock it out of the sky. Any indication they tried? No, not according to the document. Um, you know, I I do recall. Uh, you know, if you if you recall uh, recently, the um, the house the house some House Oversight Committee uh, grilled Jennifer Granholm, the Secretary of the Energy, and uh, she was emphatic that you know they have anti drone measures, they have security to take care of stuff like this. So I mean, to, you know, to your point, Jeremy, uh, this is just like another indication that. Um, we're not dealing with prosaic objects necessarily here. Yeah, that was the um, attitude of everybody I've spoken with who they literally are the first line of defense. They do work with FBI and a number of other agencies when there is an event, but these things should be automatically shot down typically, but it avoided the, the normal detection process and came right through the base. I mean, look, it was big enough to be holding major bombs or something like that, but these are very anomalous, these types of incursions. But they go back a long while. And this is something George said to me about your article. Then you really contextualized it. You, you posted in your article something from November 8th, 1957, a newspaper covered in, in Amarillo Globe Times. They, they covered mis mystery objects sighted at Pantex. And you put an image from that article. So what you've uncovered 
what we've known too is that these these incursions go far before we had drones or anything of the like. Is that correct? That is correct. And, you know, I mean, the, the, my article also, um, I believe I, I scraped up a couple of uh, alleged reports from employees at, uh, who were working at the plant during the, in, the, in the 50s, too. And they were describing diamond-shaped objects. Like, you know, I mean, it's just, it's very, very strange. This was an interesting sentence in your report that jumped out at me. Images of the object were subsequently analyzed by the Energy Department's Sandia National Laboratory. Whatever conclusion were drawn from this data about the object and incursion are not known. The images in the report were redacted. So for sure, they've got images of whatever this thing was. For sure, Sandia studied it. And for absolute certainty, they are not sharing their conclusions or the images with the public, right? Absolutely correct. So, Dustin, what, what's the next move for someone like you where you, you got this like, oh, my gosh, they actually gave me something. What are your next moves to look into the 2015 UAP incursion into Pantex that you uncovered? And, and because I've given you the date now, is there something you can do maybe to try to find out more of the 20, end of 2013 incursion of the jellyfish U, UAP? Jeremy, you were reading my mind. Yes, I'm, I'm definitely going to be uh, looking into the 2013 incident now. Um, I'm also going to try to continue uh, uncovering more information about this, this, uh, this Pantex 2015 incident as well. And I also think that, you know, if it's happening at, at, at this facility, um, you know, it must be happening at other, at, at other facilities that are similar to Pantex too, you know, because as we know, there's a history of these things being attracted to, to uh, atomic energy, to, you know, nuclear or, you know, energy and things like that. So, yeah. Uh, I would rec- recommend, to our listeners, Robert Hastings, who was sort of the OG, the the godfather of UFOs and nukes, uh, has done uh, really great work for a very long time, getting witnesses to come forward, obtaining documents. If you haven't seen some of Robert Hastings' previous work, Mystery Wire is the the site that uh, KLAS set up for my UFO related information. Have some great reports and interviews with Hastings, and I encourage people to check that out. In addition, as Jeremy and I have talked about before and which I reported for KLAS, there was something called Project Twinkle in the very earliest days of the uh, U.S. nuclear weapons program where these green fireballs were uh, zipping around over Los Alamos, over Sandia, over White Sands, all these places where nuclear weapons, nuclear missiles and bombs were being developed. They kept seeing these things. There was nothing they could do about it. They reached no conclusions, but if people want to see how long this has been going on, uh, dig back into Project Twinkle and see what you find. And I, uh, I don't know, Dustin, you've gone that far, but it might be the subject of a future article for you. Oh, no, I actually, uh, when I wrote about the, um, the UAP Disclosure Act, I actually got, it was a very long uh, piece. But, I, you know, I, what I like to do with my work is I like to, uh, you know, provide con- like historical context, too, because to me, that's what make this pheno- this makes this phenomenon so interesting and real to me, you know? So um, in this article, I did talk about, about uh, the, uh, the green fireballs and how like Dr. Lopez, Lincoln Lopez, you know, studied this and said, what well, these were yeah. not years or anything like that. So, yeah. Well, it's pretty clear that this phenomenon has been going on a long time over our nuclear facilities, over sensitive airspace, all over our country, all over the world. Uh, these objects uh, are certainly don't sound like they're Chinese drones that they've been flying in our skies from the late 1940s on. They fly over these uh, facilities with impunity. It is difficult for us to even lock onto them and track them. It seems impossible. We don't even know for sure that they tried to shoot them down. But if they tried, they failed. These are pretty startling revelations. If it was Chinese or Russian technology, we are in big trouble if they can fly through these bases and we can't do anything about it. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Dustin, yeah, thank you so much. Th- thank you so much, Dustin. I, I really enjoy reading your articles. I encourage you to keep it up. George shared them with me, and I, I looked through your whole Substack. So, what's a really easy way for people to find your writing and your work right now? Um, I mean, just you know, Google UAP register and subscribe. It's all free, uh, and that's that's pretty much all I got. <laughs> um, is there? Can I add? What's one your social thing? media? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my, sure. I, I'm, I'm on Twitter at uh, at Dustin Slaughter. Well, one word. 
And um, I just wanted to, you know, encourage people to, um, you know, contact uh, their senators, um, you know, find out the, you know, it, find out if their senators are members of the Senate Committee on Energy and National, uh, National Resources, because we need to have DOE officials put under oath at a hearing to find out what the hell is going on at, the, at these sites. So, thanks. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how Arrow tried to dismiss this or if they even were aware that this incident, as well as the, the 2013 incident, ever happened at Pantex and what their ridiculous explanation might be. I suspect, though, that they just glossed over it, and didn't pay any attention to it at all. Dustin, the UAP register is terrific work. Thanks for joining us. We want to be sure to support uh, your work and, and let the public know about it. Uh, this was a terrific piece and an important piece, and I hope people will read it. Jeremy, from time to time, you and I like to encourage the new voices in the UFO field. And Dustin Slaughter sounds like he's doing some great work and is here to stay. Hope people will check out his work. If you want additional information about UFOs and nukes, Robert Hastings uh, reports about uh, on KLAS that I posted on Mystery Wire is worth looking at. We have the Project Twinkle documents there as well. Uh, you know, Dustin's information is pretty darn important. Uh, number one. It proves that there are still files of UFO type events, UAP events, mystery drones over sensitive places that the U the public has never seen before. This was a jewel sitting there in the Department of Energy. He it took him a couple of years to get them to cough it up, and even then it was he heavily redacted. But they're not going to volunteer this information on their own, and you have to wonder how did Arrow explain this away if they addressed it at all. Secondly, you know, the important thing is that there are images. We're always screaming about, show us the video, show us the photos. They exist. They were captured there. Much like the the uh, jellyfish video that we broke open, uh, it's hard sometimes to have cameras and thermal sensors and things like that even lock on to these mystery objects like the jellyfish. But when they do get those images, it goes up the chain and gets stuck in a closet somewhere. We never get to see it. I hope that members of Congress will read Dustin's article and will react to it by asking DOE the next time they're in front of them, hey, where the hell are these images at? We want to see them. Yeah. And just to be really clear, it was really neat when, when Dustin found that 2015, you know, diamond shaped UAP incursion event. But again, what we released with the jellyfish UAP was, was over Iraq. This, what we're talking about is 2013 in Pantex. Now, that footage exists. That footage is thermal footage, and it shows to people that specifically, in, you know, were kind of responsible for some of this footage. It was eerily the same jellyfish shape. I mean, eerily the same. So I started making calls, and and I because I know that the FBI was involved in twenty in twenty thirteen. I know that as a fact. So I started calling people that I thought they would call. So I did this like last week. And I started reaching out. Nobody would admit that the FBI kind of met with them. A lot of people, they got this, like, I work at Pantex too kind of thing. They, they're not allowed to talk about it. But for sure, the FBI was involved in 2013. So you know these cases are reported in some way to agencies like FBI, and they actually do interviews about these cases. A lot of people know about these. The fact we know in 2015 there were images that were sent to a national lab, and those were redacted. I mean, look, th that's not transparency. So I, 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 like you, I just encourage like Congress and Senate to keep pushing and for people to keep doing great articles like this. I, I do want to talk a little bit about the commitment that I see from, uh, from, from senators and from Congress people. You and I recently had a conversation with some of the insiders to Senate who were, you know, telling us, Hey, look, we, we tried really hard. We got really far and we're not done. They might have removed out of the National Defense Authorization Act a lot of that Schumer amendment. But um, Senator Schumer, Senator Rounds, and everybody involved, they're not putting it down. We were encouraged recently, you and I were encouraged recently, that they're going to reintroduce the important elements of the act in the NDAA of 2025 that the UAP advocacy community, I guess, like UFO X and everybody that's interested in this, that you know you should be supporting the reintroduction of that legislation um, and, and aiming at kind of getting it out more in the media 
to encourage you know the senators to do what they said they would do, which is the future actions, the commitment to reintroducing this um, this language, hopefully in a way this time where it will definitively pass. So I kind of want to give a shout out to everybody in Senate and Congress who's been fighting for this. They're not putting it down, and, and neither should we. And it's true. I mean, we've talked about it on Weaponized before. You know, public engagement on this subject is really important. Yes. Keeping their feet to the fire, letting elected members of Congress know your interest in the subject is real and it's not going away. And we'd like you to push for transparency. And a lot of them seem to have gotten the message. There are some what I would call bad actors uh, in key leadership positions that have tried, tried to thwart uh, public interest and public investigations and transparency into this subject, uh, as important as it is. Uh, I hope hope that this time uh, they can be overcome, that the forces in favor of transparency and openness and honesty will prevail. But, you know, um, I, I try not to be too optimistic or get my hopes up because we've, you know, we've seen defeats on, on this issue many times in the past. Right. And that's the idea of like control of disclosure that you balance the national security concerns with like getting the transparency for it on this. And sometimes you get a rub where it just doesn't go the way that you want. However, you know, this idea that people are coming forward or want to come forward, I can one more time attest to the fact just really recently, we were told about a whole group of, of whistleblowers who want to speak with us who, who are working together to get information out because it didn't, it was like the easy way didn't work. So now we got to go the hard way. So you and I are currently investigating it. These are not known people. These are not people that spoke with anybody else. These are people that are coming be like, here's what we know. And then we have to assess this. It's going to take a little time, but there are people on the inside with first direct hand knowledge that are, or they claim they have that, but coming through good pedigree of individuals connected to us. So I put a little bit of weight on that, you know, when we get tips like this. But yeah, I, I do believe that it will take some time and we'll be working with government, but also individuals just coming forward and doing, you know, these types of uh, congressional hearings, like like with David Grush, Commander Fravor, uh, Lieutenant Ryan Graves. So that's, look, it's an all domain kind of uh, action that we're trying to take when we're moving forward, moving this topic forward through journalism and also just utilizing, you know, the media to get the, the, the message out. So I, I'm hopeful, George, even if we've had some setbacks here or there, I'm hopeful, man. People should keep fighting. Yeah, absolutely. Stay engaged. Let members of Congress know that the issue is important to you because it makes a difference when you reach out to them. I mean, it seems like a cliche uh, right to your congressman, but it is true. And it makes a difference because you know, as we've said before, there are so many competing issues, more pressing issues for members of Congress, the economy and national security matters unrelated to UAP that always take precedence over UFOs. So you got to let them know it's important to you and they'll pay attention to it. There's still uh, progress to be made. And the last thing I just want to say is that when we do these episodes and we tell you about like 2021 off the coast of Japan, UFO swarms, they give you those details. We're, you know, we're just two people. This takes everybody. So it takes if, if something interests you in what we said, these these cases, such as the, the, the 2013 jellyfish at Pantex, go into it. Try to shake the trees. Try to get information. It's a it's a group effort. That's why I like what Dustin did. Anyway, George, um, always fun to talk with you. Uh, this will be a great episode. I'm glad that we, we could get you here. Um, I think you and I will just talk as necessary with Weaponized, but it's great to be back in this saddle doing this with you, man. I feel the same way. I hope people will check out the previous episodes, the first season of Weaponized. For example, the, the program where we talked about uh, the Pantex uh, UFO, uh, uh, the episode where we talked about the jellyfish in Iraq. Uh, there's a lot of material there, and if people haven't viewed it before, or even if they have, they should review it again and uh, get up to speed. All right. Well, let's see what the UFO world gifts us over the next month, and we'll be back. All right. Talk to you soon. Never have so few had so much to tell, but could say so little. 